I am delighted uh, on behalf of the store to welcome Kai Bird to Politics and Prose for a discussion of his new book, The Good Spy, The Life and Death of Robert Ames. Uh, many of you know that Kai's a, a noted writer and biographer, also a contributor uh, to the nation. He's the winner of a Pulitzer Prize for American Prometheus, a biography of J. Robert Oppenheimer that he co-authored, and the recipient of a number of uh, very prestigious awards and fellowships. The Good Spy is his fifth book, and we just uh, realized that he has been here as a speaker for all of them. So we are glad to know that we are batting a 1,000 with you. So thank you for coming back for this one. Uh, and, and what a book this is. It's a biography of one of the most influential and unusual CIA operatives in the agency's history, Robert Ames whose life ended tragically and too soon when he was killed along with 62 others in the truck bombing of the U.S. Embassy in Beirut, Beirut in 1983. The book explores in rich and compelling detail the work of an agent who was a rarity when he joined the agency, a rarity in being fluent in Arabic, of course that was extremely rare back in those days, and a rarity for his non-traditional approach to spycraft, one that melded espionage and backdoor diplomacy in his cultivation of assets. But, uh, and if you've read the book, you will know that this is uh, also much more than a biography. It provides one of the clearest windows to date into life in the middle ranks of the CIA. Uh, Kai had access not only to a trove of personal letters, uh, but also to agents and colleagues, and I assume some of them are in this room, uh, who were willing to discuss on the record the nuances of the United States' efforts to deal with the PLO, the Israelis, and other actors in the Middle and Near East in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. I just wanted to mention that as an aside, our old friend David Ignatius, uh, himself of course an expert on the Middle East, columnist and writer and novelist uh, uh, at the Washington Post, um, was in here today, and he mentioned that he had been at an event for Kai in the last day or so, and that he was really uh, noticed how many uh, agency folks were there. And um, <laughs> but what he said was was so important about that, and I think it's worth mentioning, is that it really uh, sort of reflects a widely shared appreciation for Kai's willingness to tell the story of Robert Ames's work, and then of course to do so with such insight and intelligence. A review in the Christian Science Monitor calls The Good Spy, quote, a meticulous and moving biography and says it makes, quote, a persuasive case that Ames might have been able to help establish peace in the Middle East. And Dwight Gardner in the New York Times was similarly praiseworthy, saying the book is, quote, a cool and authoritative biography. We are so delighted to have you here tonight. Uh, we can't wait to hear what you're uh, going to tell us in more detail about the book. So please, all of you, join me in welcoming Kai Bird to Politics and Politics. Well, I'm really delighted to be here. This is like home. Um, I haven't been living in D.C. for some years because my wife has taken me to Kathmandu and Lima. Oh, a little closer to the mic, yes. So I'm, I'm back in D.C. after almost an absence of eight years. And, uh, but but I, every one of my books has been inaugurated at Politics and Prose, and I'm very grateful that it's here and thriving and that there's so many loyal, um, loyal readers in Washington, D.C. Uh, I don't want to talk, at, give a long speech, because I know there are a lot of people here who uh, were either part of this story or knew about it or who have questions. But I'm going to give you a sort of flavor of, of Bob Ames and how I came about to write this book. Um, I'm going to begin on a day in September 1993, uh, ten years after his death, when Yasser Arafat was about to shake hands with Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin on the White House lawn. Closer to the mic. To the mic. That's, that's my father yelling at me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <coughs> so it's September 93, and um, a senior CIA clandestine officer, the head of uh, clandestine operations for the Middle East named Frank Anderson, was on his way to work that morning. And he should have been in a good mood because finally something good was about to happen in the Middle East. But he was a little uneasy, and when he got to his office that morning, he convened his regular 9 o'clock uh, staff meeting and turned to an aide and said, so who's going to be representing the CIA, the agency, 
um, on the White House lawn today. And a phone call was made, and the answer was no one. And so Frank turned to his, his aide and said, uh, let's get a couple of buses and round up some young officers, both from the clandestine division and analysts, and let's go visit our dead. And they did so, and at the moment when Arafat and Rabin were reluctantly shaking hands, and Bill Clinton was literally forcing them together, uh, they were standing around Bob Ames's gravesite here at National Ar Arlington Cemetery, which I just happened to visit again this morning. And Anderson s stood there at the gravesite and tried to explain uh, that what Ames had done as a young uh, CIA officer starting in 1969 really planted the seeds of what we now call the Oslo peace process. And he did so, he explained, by uh, forming a friendship, a highly secret clandestine friendship, with a young man, a Palestinian named Ali Hassan Salame who was um, initially sort of Yasser Arafat's chief bodyguard, then ho chief of his Force 17, and his virtual intelligence uh, chief. Um, now, in 1969, of course, uh, no U.S. government official, no diplomat could be seen meeting with anyone from the PLO. It was a banned organization. It was a terrorist organization. And um, yet in 69, Ames managed to uh, form a relationship. Initially, I think th the idea was that he was going to target this young Palestinian for recruitment. Uh, they had a meeting in very clandestine fashion, orchestrated uh, they <coughs> by a young man named Mustafa Zain, who sort of served as as Ames's informal access agent and introduced uh, Salome to him. Uh, and uh, initially it was in a cafe in ha Rue Hamra, the Strand Cafe in, in West Beirut. And uh, later they met in a safe house in Beirut. And uh, <clears throat> Ames quickly understood that this young Palestinian Salome was not recruitable. But he saw that he was in a position of influence and uh, that he could f form a friendship and perhaps a sort of secret back channel to this very influential and dangerous organization. Uh, Frank Anderson later said that, <coughs> he told me, professionally speaking, they each were the most significant person in each other's lives. And it was a most odd relationship because Bob Ames was a six foot three tall, very handsome American, blonde, blue eyes. He wore cowboy boots and sported aviator tinted glasses. Uh, you know, he stuck out like a sore thumb as an American walking down the streets of Beirut. He was a family man. He was m devoted to his wife. Uh, he had eventually six children. Um, Ali Hassan Salome was about 28 years old then. He favored all black clothes with a black leather jacket, gold chain. Uh, he, <laughs> he looked like a playboy. He loved good red wine, expensive fast cars, and beautiful women. And indeed, uh, to Ames's horror, one a few years later, he or not horror, but um, uh, distaste. He he married Ali Hassan married uh, Georgina Rizik, who was Miss Lebanon in 1971, and then crowned by Bob Barker in Miami Beach as Miss Universe. <laughs> uh, <coughs> Ames disapproved of the relationship. He liked Ali Hassan's first wife, actually. <laughs> and disapproved of this uh, affair. Um, in any case, it, was, it became a very important relationship. Uh, 
particularly as the Lebanese Civil War began in 1975-76, Ali Hassan provided security for the embassy, which happened to be located in Fatah territory under the control of the PLO in West Beirut. Uh, And it also was a relationship in which it was a two-way street, clearly. Um, Ali Hassan was attempting to influence Ames to persuade his government to talk and recognize the PLO. And Ames was attempting to encourage Ali Hassan and Arafat to think more realistically about their efforts to achieve Palestinian aspirations, to put down the guns, and to start thinking about uh, a two-state solution. And indeed, if you look at the trajectory of the PLO's position over the, the, that decade of, of the 1970s, it, it slowly evolved in that direction. And I would argue Ames did indeed start this process. Um, but <coughs> let's see, I don't want to, again, go on too long. Um, But to finish the story, the heart, the heart of the, the biography is their relationship, and, and it lasted 10 years, I said. And throughout this period, Ali Hassan Salame was a target. Uh, the Israelis attempted to kill him on at least three occasions, once with a letter bomb, and on that in that instance, he had been warned by Ames not to open any mail addressed to his apartment, his private apartment in West Beirut. And indeed, one day a package came and he took it to his office and had it x-rayed and it was a, a letter bomb. Uh, the Israelis also went after him in, in the summer of 1973, a team of five Mossad agents thought they had got him and, and assassinated him on a street in Lillehammer, Norway, uh, but it was a case of mistaken identity. They instead uh, killed a young Moroccan waiter who was married to a Norwegian woman. Um, that shut down the, the attempt to kill Ali Hassan and <coughs> for a time. But then in, in 1977, Menachem Begin was elected prime minister of Israel and he reactivated the, uh, the campaign to get Salome. And uh, it's, it's sort of a tense, I mean, a very dramatic moment in the book is, is where I try to explain what happened in the summer of 78 when a Mossad agent approached uh, Ames's boss, a man named Alan Wolf in London, and said, point blank, is Ali Hassan your man? Uh, Wolf sort of angrily turned away and walked off, but he reported this conversation back to headquarters in Langley, and a debate took place um, inside the agency. Well, how do we answer the Israelis? Yet another Mossad agent reportedly came out to Washington to see Ames himself to ask the same question, and uh, they didn't really know what to say because Ali Hassan had always refused to be recruited. He always refused to sign a contract, to take any money. Um, So he wasn't technically their man. Uh, It was a liaison, a secret liaison relationship. Um, And so the dilemma was if they told the Israelis he is our man, it wasn't true, but also the Israelis could turn around and might leak that information in Beirut making Salome a target to his own people. Uh, If they said, no, he's not our man, then that might have been a green light to the Israelis to go ahead. So they decided in the end that the best thing to do was to say nothing. No answer was an answer, though. And uh, Ames warned uh, Salome again to beef up his security, uh, but in January of 1979, uh, he was driving on his regular route in a convoy with a truck behind with a machine gun mounted in the flatbed and in, his, in, the, in a sh- beat up old Chevy station wagon with two bodyguards on each side. He was a very public figure. Um, 
and as he drove by a an apartment building a young woman uh, sitting on the balcony pushed a remote control button and a Volkswagen bug car packed with explosives exploded and uh, he was killed along with eight other people some of them innocent bystanders uh, I also get into sort of why this happened. Well, one of the reasons was I, I found four Israeli Mossad agents, officers who, in Tel Aviv, who had known Ames. And we discussed, well, why was Ali Hassan a target? And they said, well, he was, we believed he was associated with the terrible Munich uh, tragedy in which 11 Israeli athletes were killed in Munich. Uh, and yet they admitted that there was not any real hard evidence of this. He was associated with Black September. Um, uh, it, it, it's a gray area. And the implication also in our discussions was actually, well, there was another reason. The reason was that he, they knew he was the conduit to this secret back channel, um, and it was a threatening idea. He, they thought that this might lead someday to Yasser Arafat standing on the White House lawn. Uh, anyway, he was killed and Ames was uh, very unhappy about this. He thought it was an unfortunate uh, setback to his efforts. Um, but interestingly enough, the relationship continued and uh, I would argue again that the the Oslo peace process it took another ten years, but it, it did happen. Um, I'll say a couple more things just about how this book came about. Uh, I I actually knew Ames when I was twelve and thirteen years old. He was my next door neighbor. And so I had vivid memories of this very tall, handsome young man. Uh, and I remember his wife in particular, who was a beautiful woman who looked like Lee Volman. And they had two baby daughters at the time. And this was in Dahran, Saudi Arabia, on a tiny little consulate compound where my father, who's here in the audience, was a, the economic officer, a regular foreign service officer, not CIA. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, of course, my father didn't tell me that Bob was a CIA officer. Um, I thought he was a regular Foreign Service officer, too. Um, but years later, I read in the paper about his death in Beirut, which actually ha happened in 1983 when a truck bomb rolled into the U.S. Embassy and uh, killed eight CIA officers, including Ames, who just happened to have arrived the previous day and a total of 17 Americans were killed and 46 Lebanese. It was the first major attack on a U.S. embassy. And uh, we have s in the audience, I know, some survivors of this attack. Ann Demerell, who's uh, a former neighbor of mine in Adams Morgan is here, and uh, you know, it was a horrendous thing. Anyway, when I read, read about this, I, I, I talked to my father about it, and he, he admitted that, yes, uh, Bob was CIA. And, <laughs> uh, and about four years ago, I decided to Google Ames's name. It's a wonderful thing, Google. Uh, and up came the name Stu Newberger. <laughs> who uh, is sitting here in the front row, and Stu is a well-known lawyer here, here in town who has represented some of the cases of victims of terrorism over the last few decades in which he sues in civil suits to try to get damages um, and restitution for the victims and survivors of some of these attacks. So Stu took on uh, the civil suit case that was filed at the behest of Anne Demerell and other survivors and the widow of, of Bob Ames in 2003. And I realized when I looked at the, this is, you can see this all online, um, trial transcripts and witness testimony, 
And it was really rich and moving and interesting material. And I thought initially, ah, oh, I can certainly do, maybe if not a biography of Ames, I can do a book about the Beirut Embassy bombing, which is sort of the forgotten bombing. Everyone remembers the Marine barracks bombing six months later. But the embassy bombing was the first one, and it killed you know, only 17 Americans. But uh, it was the beginning. And so I, I flew to Washington, met with Stu, got more documents from him, uh, met with Anne Demerell, and then I contacted Yvonne, who lives in a small town in North Carolina. And uh, she gave, she's, I was the first journalist she was willing to talk to um, about this after so many years. And she actually said at the end of our second day of interviews, as I was walking out the door, she said, well, you know, I think there are some letters. <laughs> Maybe in a suitcase in an attic somewhere. And I said, oh? <laughs> uh, you know, this is the biographer's best dream and worst nightmare. Uh, if you don't find that proverbial suitcase of letters, uh, th there's a, you know, a, a huge missed opportunity, a gapping hole. Um, anyway, it took six months. She found the letters, and the, it, they turned out to be 150 pages of handwritten letters that Bob had written to her periodically over the years during his short-term visits. You know, when he, she was still, she was back home taking care of the kids and he was on a TDY, a temporary duty station in Beirut or Aden or, and the letters were wonderful. They gave you an insight into both Bob's personality and, you know, they were sometimes mundane and writing about family, but he also wrote about his work. He trusted his wife, and uh, his wife knew all about his relationship with Ali Hassan Salome. And so you can see Ames, um, a sort of his daily routine as a CIA officer, and uh, you can see his, his, the roller coaster ride he had in his attempts to maintain his relationship with Salome. Um, and it, it gives you an insight into, you know, the, the real life of a, a, a CIA intelligence officer who, you know, it's not a James Bond life. He was no James Bond. He did occasionally have to wear a pistol in his belt, particularly in places like Aden in 1967, where it was very dangerous to walk the streets, and sometimes in Beirut, but he hated guns. Uh, this was a man who really uh, made no enemies in his life, except occasionally he had rivals inside the CIA, <laughs> bureaucratic politics who, um, uh, but he made lots of friends, and that was his genius, I argue. That was his, uh, that's why he's a model intelligence officer. He understood that uh, his job was to uh, feel empathy for other people, and particularly for uh, the, f the foreigners that he was living amidst. And he learned the language. He was one of the f probably a half dozen CIA officers who had enough Arabic so that he could read the daily newspaper and conduct a conversation about politics with a native speaker. Um, he loved the Middle East. He understood that it was a dangerous territory dangerous neighborhood, as the Israelis are often want to say. Um, but he also understood that they, they were ordinary people there who were making their way, trying to make their, their, their way in life. And he sympathized with you know, the, the chaos and, the, and the, the insecurities brought to the Middle East by all these wars. And he genuinely wanted to try to affect a nonviolent, peaceful resolution of this terrible festering conflict between the Israelis and Palestinians. Um, finally, the other breakthrough, aside from these letters from Ames, uh, from Yvonne Ames, his letters to Yvonne Ames, I, 
<clears throat> in one of my early interviews with, well, when I first started out, I went to see David Ignatius, who was just mentioned. And David uh, had been a reporter in Beirut at the time of the U.S. Embassy bombing. And right after the bombing, he went to see a source of his who uh, turns out to have been Mustafa Zain, a, who was Ames's best friend. Uh, Mustafa Zain was a s very young Shiite Lebanese businessman uh, who served as Ames's sort of access agent, but he never took any money. He never took a dime from the CIA. He never signed a contract. He was never under control. But Ames used him, and Zayn was a great sort of raconteur. He knew everybody from Gamal Abdel Nasser to various politicians and, and the Sheikh of Sharjah, whom he had worked for. Uh, you know, he was a fixer, an operator, an entrepreneur who just loved to put people together. And uh, he happened to know Ali Hassan Salama. And uh, anyway, in the wake of the bombing, Ignatius saw Mustafa Zain, interviewed him. Zain had, had been devastated by Ames's death in the embassy bombing. And the result was a novel called Agents of Innocence that was published in 1987. And to this day, if you're a young, freshly minted CIA officer, you're often told, oh, you should read Agents of Innocence to get an idea of what it's really like. Um, anyway, I went to see Ignatius, and I asked him if, if it was possible to do a biography of Ames, who was the the real subject of, of his book, a Agents of Innocence. And David was very encouraging. He said, however, that, that it would only be possible if you could track down Mustafa Zain. And no one knew where Mustafa was then. A Ignatius himself had lost track of him. Uh, so I, I pursued many dead ends. And finally, someone uh, gave me someone, a retired CIA officer, gave me a cell phone number. And I called this, I was sitting, I was writing this book actually in Lima, Peru, where my wife had dragged me. And, <coughs> and uh, I, I called this number on Skype, cold, and Mustafa answered sitting in Amman on his cell phone. And I introduced myself, and he, his first question was, you know, where did you get this telephone number? <laughs> Only certain people have it. <laughs> and I said, Mustafa, I can't say that, you know, but it's a friend. And uh, anyway, Mustafa was at a moment in his life, like Yvonne was at a moment in her life, where she actually wanted to talk. And Mustafa wanted this story told. And he was... Um, he was adamant about trying to solve the mystery of who did it as well. And so I, two months later, I found myself in Amman. I spent eight days with him, seven, eight, nine, ten hours a day taking notes. He was exhausting because he's a great storyteller, but he talks fast and uh, he's, he's got uh, a phenomenal memory and but it turns out he also had saved letters that Ames had written to him. So there again, I had, you know, the biographer's dream, an access to a, a way to, a written documentation to authenticate Mustafa's stories. Um, and so I, <coughs> I say all this sort of by way of explaining how the book came together, um, despite the fact that I had no cooperation at all from the the CIA officially. I actually went to them uh, early on in the project and tried to get their cooperation, and uh, nothing ever happened. But uh, one source led me to another, and most of these were retired CIA officers who had known Ames and admired him and thought that it was time for his story to be told. And uh, I got them to talk and and 
Uh, in addition, I went to Israel and I found four of these Mossad officers who also agreed to talk. Um, anyway, it was a lot of fun. It was a fabulous story. Um, and I'll, I'll end, well, I should, I'll end on two notes. First, the book does lay out the mystery of what happened on April 18, 1983, and partly re as a result of Stu Neuberger's work in the civil suit, um, there, was a, there, there was a court judgment that decided that, yes, the Islamic Republic of Iran was responsible. This wasn't an operation carried out by a lone assassin, a suicide bomber. It, it was an orchestrated thing, a big operation, 2,000 pounds of military-grade plastic explosives that in the court cases, uh, it was discovered that this material was manufactured, wasn't available in Lebanon, but was manufactured only in a military factory in Iran. Um, and it was a, an operation by intelligence officers associated with the is, uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard. And so I went back and I did more detective work based on the court records and also based on interviews out there in the Middle East. And I actually, in the end, named some names of the, intellig the Iranian intelligence officers who were stationed in the Bekaa Valley that summer of 782 in the wake of the Israeli invasion. And I named one in particular who, to my astonishment, um, had an extraordinary career. He spent 10 years he was involved in this operation. He seems to have been the, the key operational planner on the ground of the truck bomb attacks on both the embassy and the Marine barracks. And he spent the, re uh, ten the next 10 years in Lebanon. He was involved in the kidnappings of many Americans uh, in the mid-'80s. And later in the 90s, he rose to be a, a general in the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard, and then became a deputy defense minister. And then in about 2003, he had a falling out with the regime, was briefly imprisoned, and then in the spring of 2007, he defects. And he travels to Syria, then bribes a border guard uh, in, on the Turkish border, gets himself into Turkey, and knocks on the door of the U.S. Embassy and he brings his laptop filled with information about, apparently, not only what he had been involved in with Hezbollah in Lebanon in the uh, 80s, but uh, information about the Iranian atomic energy program. Uh, so it seems that the man who was most closely complicit in killing these eight CIA officers and Robert Ames uh, was at one point at least here in Washington and was debriefed by uh, the intelligence community and we don't know where he is now. Um, it's, uh, I think, just an astonishing story but also a window into a classic intelligence dilemma. Um, you know, one of my sources told me, well, you know, you have to, to get good information about bad neighborhoods. You have to deal, and, uh, deal with uh, bad guys. Uh, and he says, you know, that means sometimes you have to sup with the devil, but you do it with a very long spoon. Um, okay, finally, I want to end on one little lighter anecdote, which gives you an insight into Ames's personality and his character, um, and I, I, I do this be on the recommendation of my 21-year-old son who's in the audience and he says it's the best story in the book. <laughs> uh, and so it's a story from about 19, spring of 1977. Uh, Ames is on a temporary duty s assignment in Beirut. Uh, it's a very dangerous time in Beirut. It's in the midst of the Civil War. Um, Beirut itself is a divided city with no man's land going right 
through the middle dividing east and west Beirut. And <coughs> Ames is one of two officers stationed in the embassy at this point where who are allowed to leave the premises without armed bodyguards. You know, because Ames as a CIA officer can't do his work if he's uh, too obvious. The other was a, the military attache, apparently. So Ames had rented a beat-up, innocuous-looking old Toyota car from a re local rental agency, and one day he had to travel from West Beirut, where he was living and where the embassy still was located, to East Beirut, and that meant he had to cross no man's land and cross one of one of these dangerous, often dangerous checkpoints. And indeed, his car was stopped at a checkpoint by uh, a contingent of Arab League peacekeepers stationed at the time, and this particular the checkpoint was manned apparently by some uh, entirely illiterate um, tribesmen from Yemen, um, armed with machine guns, and um, they asked him to get out of the car, and they search the car and they pop his trunk and they all jump back because they see in the trunk a tubular metallic object that they assume must be a bomb. Um, and Ames realizes his life is at stake and, and he musters his, his Arabic to try to explain to these illiterate Yemeni tribesmen that this is a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> and uh, of course they hadn't seen a vacuum cleaner, had no notion what <laughs> such a thing, why would anyone need a vacuum cleaner? <laughs> uh, and, but Ar his, this is a sign of Ames's, the quality of his Arabic, he, he must have been able to explain this sufficiently to um, calm them down a bit. And he later wrote in a, a note uh, to his wife about this incident that the whole time he was thinking of Graham Greene's the, 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 Our Man in Havana, <laughs> which is all, of course, about a vacuum salesman, <laughs> vacuum cleaner salesman. Um, so he, Ames was a wonderful, funny, uh, he had a wry sense of humor, he was very literate, he was, um, many of his colleagues in the agency were astonished by his library and how much he read. Um, and they called him too much of an intellectual for his job. Literally some of his bosses criticized him on these grounds. But he was a very complicated, interesting, affable, lovely man who um, tragically died at the age of 49. So I think I've gone on too long, but um, I hope we have time for plenty of questions. <laughs> questions, questions. It, it seems that, uh, from what I've read, that Ames was sort of a, a, a Palestinian sympathizer and, and uh, and uh, you know Jimmy Carter as well in his book uh, about peace, not apartheid, is is in some ways uh, have same view that that there's a there seems to be two opposing views in this country that you know there's a possibility of peace that Ames had and promoted, uh, and and so did Jimmy Carter, yet. The, the administrations, not just this administration, but others, you know, denying uh, visas to, a visa to Jimmy Carter to travel to the Middle East and so forth. And I'm wondering what your view, after doing all this research and, and thinking about all of these issues, what is your own personal view of, of you know, how this, these opposing ideas of, of uh, you know, s supporting the, the a Palestinian state as well as right. Palestinian support. Right. Mm. Well, yes, Ames was, you know, like most CIA officers, like most Foreign Service officers stationed in the in the Arab world, he he quickly acquired a, a certain empathy and sympathy for the plight of the Palestinian refugees, 
and um, he could be, you know, highly critical of Israel. However, I, I also, you know, he was a very empathetic man. He wasn't an ideologue. And I have a, an anecdote in the book where I quote a letter from him to his wife, Yvonne. Um, he's in Jerusalem, and he's wandering around the old city, and he comes upon the Wailing Wall, and he sees hundreds of Jews um, praying there at this sacred site. And he writes to Yvonne, you know, that it, it was a moving scene to him, and it brought home to him again uh, why this city should never be divided again in a way that would deny the, the, the rights of these people to, to have access to this religious experience. Um, and he later, as he rose up higher, you know, he switched from the clandestine to the analytical side of the agency towards the end of his life and rose very high. He became the guy who was briefing Ronald Reagan in 1982 and 83 regularly in the Oval Office and in Camp David. And that required, a, a part of his job then became liaison, having liaison meetings with his Israeli Mossad counterparts. And so he would go to Tel Aviv and, and they knew exactly who he was. They knew that he was the guy who had opened up this back channel. They were very curious to meet him and actually they loved him. <laughs> they, he would argue with them and Israelis love a good argument. <laughs> And uh, he was straight, and he, he wasn't trying to hide his views, and, and he showed that he was empathetic to their, you know, understood the, the, the complexity of their security situation. And he truly believed that there was a possibility for peace, that this conflict doesn't have to go on and on and on. And I, I, I'm of that view. I support a two-state solution. I think it could happen tomorrow if there was a political will and leadership and everyone knows what it should be. It's not rocket science. It's sharing the land, the green line basically of the 67 borders and one-to-one -one swaps of land and, and you know, uh, but alas, I'm not optimistic about it. <laughs> Jeff. Kai. Um, fabulous book. Um, it strikes me in listening to you and in reading your book that, that the NSA couldn't accomplish any of this. <laughs> <laughs> that it took one really talented clandestine officer to forge this relationship and move that forward. I wonder if you had any uh, reflections on the value of clandestine operations right. in general. Uh, great question. Uh, yeah, no, that's the theme of the book. Um, y you know, we've been reading all about the in the last year the value and the necessity of, of uh, intercept intelligence to secure our, our country's security. But I think if you read The Good Spy, you'll come to have sort of some second thoughts about that, and you'll understand that uh, human intelligence, this one-to-one -one ability to create relationships in dangerous parts of the world with, with enemies, with critics, is essential um, because the intercept intelligence can't give you a sense of motivations uh, or intentions. And uh, it's very transitory. And Jeff is right. It, you know, th th this relationship that Ames created with Ali Hassan Salome couldn't have happened without uh, many, many one-on-one -on -one meetings in which, you know, literally they broke bread together, they dined together in each other's apartments, um, they got to know each other's families. Um, you know, trust was built up slowly. And actually the letters show Ames, you know, it was a difficult thing. It was a difficult thing after Munich when it, Ames thought that Ali Hassan may have been involved in the Munich Olympics tragedy. Um, and you can see him writing with, with great anguish about this. But it's, it brings home the, the, classic, the, the importance. If there's a role for intelligence, there must, you know, it must first and foremost, I would argue, be um, involve this human intelligence. 
Now, I do quote, um, uh, actually, Henry Miller Jones, one of my sources who helped a great deal on the book, um, and new aims as a young agency officer in Aden. Uh, he reminded me that I even, although this is one of the themes in my book, I do quote uh, that other spy, maybe not a good spy, <laughs> Kim Philby, uh, the, the, the British uh, a officer who spied for the Russians. I quote Kim Philby from his, his autobiography in which he says that, you know, a document is just a document without you know, a document too can lie. Um, but Kim Philby also ar argued that, you know, you need both. You need, you, you need the, the intercept, the wiretaps, you need the intelligence collection for on a one-to-one -one basis. And I, you know, I, I can't really argue with that. Anne. Question. How do you think the official community, not just the CIA, but the administration, State Department, is going to react after this is out for a while. And do you think this, this book will shake loose any information about Bob Ames that now you don't have access to? Well, I certainly hope it's going to shake loose some more information. And I certainly hope it's going to help Stu Newberger and the other civil suit cases to, to uh, achieve some kind of uh, resolution and reparations for the victims, including you. Um, you know, these judgments have been handed down. They've been sitting there for more than a decade. And, um, and yet, you know, we're, we're involved right now in a very delicate negotiation with Iran, trying to persuade them to stand down over their weaponization of their nuclear technology. And, uh, but I, I think the book will help make, remind everyone in the Obama administration and the State Department who sort of may regard these civil suits as a nuisance, an impediment to these negotiations, that they can't actually have a, any successful resolution, any deal with Iran without take, handling these cases. And that means, you know, some, some compromise, some acknowledgement of what happened, um, some measure of justice. And, uh, you know, as an historian, I think that's important, too, to acknowledge the history. Uh, as to their reaction, um, you know, it's, the book has literally been out for three days. And, <laughs> uh, and I, I have to say, it's really... Uh, Three weeks ago, I came to, came to Washington when there were no books available, but I attended a conference of, of the Association of Former Intelligence Officers. And I walked into this conference room in a hotel out in Virginia, and there were 150 retired intelligence officers, some FBI, but some agencies, and they were all really interested in reading this book. <laughs> Um, and I think, you know, it's a very sympathetic book to their world. Um, however, the politicians and the people at the top are going to have a difficulty with the end story. You know, this guy, Asghari, defected in 2007. Of course, that meant it was under the Bush administration. So, <laughs> uh, but... Uh, and they don't want to, and they're denying that they had anything to do with arranging his defection, which may well be true. He, I think he arranged his own defection. Um, but they have to deny this um, because they have to protect not only this individual, but the, uh, ostensibly the the long waiting line that exists of other sources who want to take advantage of asylum in America. And uh, so, you know, it's a very delicate problem. And the book is, I'm afraid, an embarrassment to some people, <laughs> uh, an embarrassing problem. But I think it, the book is, is it's such a, 
sympathetic story to a hero of the intelligence community that uh, I think in the long term is going to um, have a long life, I hope. <laughs> Hi, Kai. Um, it's a bit of a sequitur to the, the last question, but um, can you surmise why the CIA uh, didn't talk to you at all after your repeated requests, even th through different directors? And how that may have, um, and, and if you um, might surmise it, what information you may have had access to. Because oftentimes, isn't that the case with the agency? It's, it's, the, uh, it's what they don't say, which is, w is what is important. Um, great question. Uh, I think they should have cooperated with me. I think it was kind of silly that they were too nervous. I, I, I suspect what happened was that George Little, the public affair, the director of public affairs at the time, who I met with, thought it was a good idea, and he bucked the idea up the ch chain of command, and no one could make a decision, and no one wanted to risk, <laughs> you know. I'm a loose cannon. I'm a journalist, a historian. Who knows what I'm going to write, you know? <laughs> uh, but it was, a, I think, a missed opportunity on their part. Um, and, you know, there have been too many books out there that are critical of the agency in a sort of slapdash, um, sensational way. And, you know, I'm, I'm a guy who's been in my previous books on McCloy and the Bundys and the Vietnam War. I, I've been critical of the CIA, but, uh, you know, here I've written a book which I think some of my left-wing friends are going to be astonished that I'm making a hero out of a CIA officer. <laughs> uh, and I think it was a missed opportunity for me in that you know, yes, I I managed to find a lot of good sources to talk to, and I found these letters. But uh, you know, I was asking from the agency a very specific thing. I said, just sit me down with one of your in-house historians, and let me spend a few hours occasionally reviewing facts, getting my chronology right, job titles. Um, and confirming what's out there on the record, and and maybe if it'd be great if you could declassify some of the memos that Ames wrote as an analyst when he was chief of the NISA for the director of intelligence, and um, which are you know over 30 years old now, and that would have you know that's a, one of the shortcomings of the book. I can't you know there there aside from his personal correspondence and Mustafa's, his letters to Mustafa, um, and a few of Ames's memos that I found in the Reagan library. I have very little, this book is mainly based on interviews. Uh, I have very little documentary evidence. And that's a missed opportunity. And I think there's no reason why they couldn't have quickly declassified on an impromptu basis a few 30, 40 year old secrets. <laughs> Oh, very good question. <laughs> did, did my wife ask you to ask that? <laughs> uh, the, the, I'm, I'm being asked, who was I employed by all these years working on this book? I, who paid for this? <laughs> um, actually, I got a very good contract from Crown Publications, which is part of Random House. And they paid me an advance that was enough, actually, to do the research on this book. Now, this has not always been the case. I, my first book, I got a, what I thought was a huge advance, and then the book took 10 years. And, I, <laughs> and my wife had to, you know, she kept asking me, when are you going to get a real job? <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> she no longer asks that. <laughs> she knows she's given up. <laughs> Um, anyway, no, I had, I had sufficient funds, and my wife, Susan, has a good salary, and <laughs> <laughs> so I have no complaints. And so I, I actually, to answer your question, I haven't had a real job in 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. 
Uh, the first time I heard about Robert Ames was when I was in Arabic class in Cairo in, in 1983, oh. and we were assigned an article on the Beirut bombing and Robert Ames. <clears throat> and I'm wondering, um, from the other side, you know, do you know how the book is playing in the Middle East, and any thoughts about it being published in Arabic? Well, I'd love it to be published in Arabic, but... Uh, you know, the publishing world here in America is going through some tough times. It's uh, going through some kind of difficult transition to the digital age, uh, and that's even more so in the Middle East and in the Arab world. Um, I do have an agent who's trying to find a Hebrew publisher, but they're apparently the Israeli publishing industry is really in the dumps. Um, I did get an email today from some reporter in the Daily Star in Beirut who informed me that they were, she was going to be writing a review of the book um, and that copies of it were going to be available next week in Beirut, which I was kind of s startled by. <laughs> and Jeff Stein is here. I, I heard he, he's a reporter for Newsweek, and he earlier this week wrote a great news story about the book and the Ascari, the revelations about Ascari and his involvement in the embassy bombing. And um, one of my sources in the Middle East tells me that that Newsweek story, probably uh, without your permission, Jeff, <laughs> it has been translated and is all over the Arabic web. <laughs> so I, I consider that a good sign, too. But... Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's a complicated story, and, um, you know, there are pieces of this book that uh, many people in the Arab world will like. Um, but on the other hand, the, I, I, I have photographs of, in the book, of the head of Hezbollah, um, Nasrallah, uh, you know, the guy in one of the black turbans in Lebanon who's the head of the Shiite community there, uh, leaning over in, in deep conversation with Imad Mugnia, who is now dead. He was assassinated probably by Mossad and the CIA together in Damascus in 2008, but he was a notorious intelligence officer, terrorist, freedom fighter, however you may call them. Uh, he was associated with a long list of operations in, and probably was involved, uh, although he was only 20 years old, he was probably involved in some way or had knowledge of the planning for the embassy attack in 83, but he was only 20 years old. Um, anyway, that book is going, the book is going to make Hezbollah very uncomfortable. So I'll be interested in the reviews that appear in the Beirut press. Um, and, you know, the, the, the book may raise some eyebrows in Israel. On the other hand, it's, it's a fabulous story for an Israeli audience. Um, you know, it's the beginning of the peace process. And alas, we're, you know, again at another stalemate. Um, but this may help to explain, you know, what went wrong on the road to peace. Um, I don't know. In, in, in any case, it's a story that should be of intense interest to an Israeli audience. And I hope it gets translated into Hebrew and Arabic and many other languages. <laughs> 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 wow.